Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have an incredibly important topic and a slightly unusual format to explore. Uh, and I'm really, really looking forward to our conversation about this, where we are right now, uh, which is our conversation about higher education in the age of the climate crisis. Now, this is an unusual session today for a couple of reasons. One is we are combining with our online book club. Our online book club has been reading the IPCC report. I'll explain that in a second. And that's usually blog-based and web-based, but right now we're adding a live video wing. So people who are reading and thinking about that can join us and, and talk. But the other thing is, this is a session where we don't have a guest. This is one of our community sessions where we put all our brains together and think hard about a particular topic. And in this case, we're trying to think about climate change using the IPCC report as a base. Now, if you're new to that report or if you can't bring it to hand, look at the bottom left of the screen. You'll see there's a, a lozenge-shaped button there that says R I line IPCC reading. Uh, and if you click that, that'll take you to all of our blog posts and discussion about it with all kinds of resources there. Now, just uh, let me just quickly introduce the, uh, the report, and then um, I'm going to start besieging you with your questions to try and learn what you think and what you'd like us to discuss. And by the way, hello to those who just greeted us in the chat. Um, Heather, I, I see you too, been zots by lightning in Madison. Hello, Vanessa in Northeastern Colorado. Roxanne, hello in Connecticut. Amy in Mesa, Arizona. We seem to be all over the country today, which is great. So the, the IPCC report is an incredibly powerful document. It's not an easy read at times. Uh, the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and this is part of the United Nations. And what these folks do is they assemble the work of scientists. And by the work of scientists, I mean thousands and thousands of climate scientists. And they basically synthesize the cutting edge research into a single document. Now, when they first do this, that single document is about 4,000 pages long, which is enormous, of course. Then and this is where our book club's in, our book club comes in, they squeeze it down even further to the mere 120 pages. And I call that the technical summary. And that is basically the best human knowledge we have about climate change. And in fact, if 120 pages is too much, they compress it even tighter down to the executive summary. Uh, which is a, called the Summary for Policymakers. It's in the government officials and the you and I. And that's, you know, like a mere 40 pages. So, I mean, that's an amazing job of synthesis and scientific analysis and writing. And these documents just really are our distillation of our thinking right now. The IPCC does this process, publishing these enormous reports every few years. And the most recent report came out in three different documents starting in November. The two most recent ones came out this April. They haven't gotten a lot of attention this year because of other events in the world like the Ukraine war, uh, but they are truly, truly extraordinary. And they are you know, the state of the art. That's where we are. So just really quickly, uh, if you can in the chat, uh, let me know if you've been following the IPCC reports. Have you been looking at the reports about them in other sources, you know, like uh, in radio or on the web? Or have you had a chance to read into them yourselves? I I'm asking not as a quiz, but uh, to figure out how much background I, I should share and how much we need to share together. So just in the chat, let me know. Uh, are you an IPCC hardcore reader? Are they completely new to you? What do you think? Novice, partial reader, somewhat. Shin Lee, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you're here so that we can share that. Excellent. Uh, somewhat, uh, completely new wrong. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Bob London does the same thing reading the executive summary. Very good. Heather Short, bravo. Bra or I should say brava. Um, I would love to. Um, if, let me know, actually, Heather, if, you're, if your video is on, I'd love to bring you up on stage. Just let me know in the chat if I can do that. Mark is waiting for the movie. So are we all. We actually haven't had a really good climate change movie yet. Thank you, Heather. And uh, another Heather C. And uh, let's see. Let me bring this up right now. Hello, Dr. Short. <laughs> Hi, Brian, how are you? I'm very good. Is it okay if I call you Dr. Short or should I call you Heather? Or what would Whatever you, you want. 
Okay, well, since you are speaking in some seriously professional capacity, I'm going to start off with Dr. Short and then and then see how it goes. Um, you you said that you were a, a close reader and a devoted reader of these. Actually, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not exactly fun reading, but no. but yes, I, I follow them closely. What, what brought you to that? Uh, I'm curious. Um, well, I've been teaching climate science for 15 years or so, and I think it's important to keep up to date with yeah. the, um, the latest science. And recently the reports that came out, especially um, on the impacts, was, uh, was, was really useful because that was, hadn't been done before, basically. Uh -huh. Um, so, yeah, so it's really, it's, and it's good to know what, what um, because people often ask me questions about what's the, you know, what's the latest science and trying to explain what it is. And, and in this report, um, the one that came out in the fall on the science uh -huh. was, um, was different in that the models have been refined. So in terms of predicting what um, possible scenarios we could have for CO2 in the atmosphere in the future, the the models were better. And then they also attempted to take into account um, these large uncertainties called positive climate feedbacks in the climate system, which are extremely difficult to model, to yeah. include in the models, but they tried to incorporate them in the technical summary, at least as a sort of long shot possibilities. Like these are the worst case scenario, but not necessarily going to happen, but we should talk about it. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for giving us your background. And, and of course, that's really powerful and very, very important. And we're actually going to circle back to that in a kind of meta way. Uh, mm -hmm. It's parts of the other reports. Uh, and thank you for teasing out the, uh, the improvements in the science. Um, the greenhouse gas emission uh, science is just getting better and the developmental pathways are, are better and better. Um, and friends, let me just remind you, uh, again, we have that button uh, on the bottom left of the screen. If you click on that, that'll take you to my blog posts, which takes you to the documents themselves if you'd like to dive in. Um, uh, I've got to call you Heather now. I've, I've got to do it. I, it's I just, fine. I feel so convivial and at the same time formal. It's just a, a divide, division in my mind. Um, you know, thinking about this, uh, I want one of the other big changes in the reports uh, is the emphasis on you know, in the US, we'd say social justice. But I think in the in the reports, it's more in a sense of kind of global equity, as well as following the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And that's that seems to be saturating the reports right now. Yes. Um, what would you like to know? <laughs> Well, I'm, 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 well, first of all, I'm saying this for everybody because this is, I think, a really important development, um, and it does impact us in education. And I'm also just curious um, what we think that looks like um, and how that might play out. So um, in terms of um, sort of global climate justice, what that looks like is the fact that not all countries have contributed equally to this climate um, problem that we have right now, nor have they, um, nor are they feeling the effects as equally. So in general, climate justice refers to the fact that the countries that have not contributed to the destruction of our climate and environment are the ones who are actually going to feel the effects first and worst, um, and then have fewer resources to deal with them. So the idea is that if we're going to address climate <clears throat> as a entire species living on this planet, that we absolutely have to take into account justice. The fact that those who are most responsible for the problems that we have right now are the ones who pay the most for it, which means wealthy countries. Um, and then within countries themselves, that also looks like um, a lot like social justice, like mm -hmm. there, it, it's it's essentially impossible to extract uh, solving the climate crisis from also paying attention to social justice issues. And that in wealthy countries, that includes acknowledging that not everybody in a wealthy country is equally responsible for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what um, the crisis that we have right now. So we need to try to um, to take that into account. And really um, one of the, I think the the best 
ways to sort of illustrate this to people and to try to convince people that it's really important to, to take justice into account when we're looking at, at the solving the climate issue is um, the issue of fairness. Fairness is something that is cross-cultural, it's cross-generational, all humans care about being fair. And there's literally no way that we can address um, the climate and ecological crises without taking um, justice and fairness into, into account, because otherwise we won't get most people on board. Well, that's a great way of putting it. Fairness is really good. It's, kind of, it's hard to be against that. Right? Yes. Um, yeah, we're the anti-fairness party. It's kind of hard to say that out loud. Right? <laughs> Support anti-fairness policy. I mean, Tom in the chat, Tom says, "Well, how do you define it?" I, I just, I'm just referring to this at the at the, at the symbolic layer. Right? At the, um, it's a it's a it's a great phrase of, uh, to summon them for that. Um, I, I think uh, there was one study. I, you're talking about the impact, sorry, the causes of, of the climate crisis. And I think this also plays out in how we respond. I, I was looking at a study of building city walls uh, against uh, against rising sea levels. And one of the uh, uh, authors pointed out that if you take a city and you build a sufficiently strong wall, <clears throat> it protects the city very nicely. Um, but what happens is that that water has to go somewhere. So it goes in both sides of the wall and then overlaps where the wall stops. So if you've got the city there that's in great shape, well, you're you're basically making it worse for the areas on either side. Exactly. Uh, so I, thought, I mean, literally, scientifically, that's that's very very good. But also, I thought that's a pretty nice symbol uh, for uh, injustice uh, and how that could uh, and how that could play out. Um, so I, I I think this is a really really important issue that we we have to keep in mind. Um, the climate justice angle. I'm putting that social justice. The climate is really, especially since this is a. a a United Nations, not a United States uh, document. Uh, climate justice is really the way of putting it. Um, what do you, you know, one, there's, there's two responses that humanity is called to do. Right? One is we're called to uh, try to mitigate the crisis, and the other is we're called on to adapt to it. Um, and my sense of the mitigation is that the new reports are a little more interested in some form of, of direct capture of carbon uh, than they were before. Um, that is, you know, devices, which some of which are natural, some of which are technological, uh, whose goal is to suck as much carbon dioxide out of the Earth's atmosphere as possible, and then hopefully store it in a way that is either useful or better yet safe. And um, I, I'm, I'm curious, Heather, this is this is such a contentious topic. Um, it is. I have <laughs> opinions about it. <laughs> oh, please, all away. Um, so I'll start off with one of my favorite statistics, which is that um, at present, the technology that we have globally to suck carbon out of the atmosphere and store it um, only takes out one one thousandth of the amount of CO2 emitted by humanity every year. So presently, our global capacity to take carbon out of the atmosphere and store it somewhere, we don't even know if we can store it for a long period of time, um, is minuscule, a absolutely minuscule. So um, it's, uh, <laughs> I like to tell people, it's like, it's like putting all of your eggs in one basket that's being carried by a toddler, right? Oh. For, the, for the future, because it's um, all of these plans for um, direct carbon capture, carbon storage, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are not nearly enough and they're not likely to ramp up uh, quickly enough to avoid passing certain tipping points in the climate system that would um, then make the job even that much harder. Yeah. So um, yeah, I hate to be the downer, but- um, uh, Well, that toddler metaphor is amazing. <laughs> and that's, uh, so that's, this is a subject we'll be talking about. Um, I was I, I was actually uh, talking with a DAC uh, entrepreneur last week, and I suggested should campuses have DAC units, and he first said no, they're they're not safe enough right now. Mm. Uh, you know, you you need to really be very careful with them. But then down the road, um, so that's interesting to see if campuses play a role in this. Uh, we, we have a, a question about the report itself, which has come up from uh, our good friend, uh, uh, Tom Hames. And I actually want to bring him on stage because I love beaming on stage. I don't get enough blue in Texas in my life. I wore the blue shirt to match the room. 
I know, I know just for you, Brian. I know, I know, and I appreciate it. But you, you had a, you had a question about the about influences on the report. Yeah, I mean, I haven't looked into this to be frank, uh, but I mean, I, I don't know if any of you guys saw the recent um, Frontline series on uh, fossil fuel companies and uh, um, the uh, let's just say creative information campaign they've been running for the last forty years. Um, but I'm wondering how much uh, they more whether they had more influence on this version of the report than older versions because. Usually when you start to see these increased uh, mentions of carbon capture, which I'm not poo-pooing carbon capture, capture, I think it can be part of the solution. I think it probably has to be part of the solution. But it's a way of saying, hey, you know what? We can always just go on a diet and lose weight. We just can eat, keep, keep eating the chocolate cake now. We're fine. You know, keep pumping that gas out at Exxon. You know, we're fine. We'll just take. We'll just clean it all out later. We've done this before. I mean... Look, the uh, Cuyahoga River caught, you know, caught fire in 1973, and now you can not walk over it. I guess I, I wouldn't swim in it, but uh, my parents live in Cleveland. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, so, um, but I mean, it always the the phraseology around some of this stuff. I mean, it's just there's the problem with it is it's such a complex issue. And there's no one. You're right. There's no one solution. It's going to be a whole host of solutions that are going to be have to be implemented. Some of them are going to be involving individual behavior. Some of them are corporate behavior. Some of them involve mitigation. Some of them involve um, uh, um, hardening because we're not going to get away from the effects of it. So uh, and explaining that in a uh, 30 second stump speech uh to a political audience um who doesn't really understand science who doesn't understand why you should wear a mask during a pandemic yeah. uh is is a huge challenge and um there's plenty of actors willing to throw mud in the water and what we've learned over the last certainly over the last decade is that you can accomplish a whole lot by just throwing mud in the water you know i mean muddying the water so that the conversation meanders and you lose focus. Hey, thoughts and prayers, guys, you know, for the planet. Well, um, that's an unfortunate phrase for this week for people living in Texas. Yeah, I know. The, but, you know, uh, I'm one of the people who's living in Texas is just disgusted more than anything else. But um, the point I'm trying to make, though, is that I'm wondering what uh, is it is it true? And I don't know the answer to this. Did did the uh, did the carbon industry have more of an effect on the uh, report than in the past? And I want to also be a little cautious about, you know, they need a voice, I think. The problem is they have too powerful a voice, generally speaking. Yeah. Um, but their, you know, their side of things needs to be heard because, you know, you talk, you talk crazy talk and say we're going to cut it all off in 10 years. That's not going to happen. We don't have the infrastructure to support that. So we've got to work on a transitionary solution to keep that, you know, to move the ball in the right direction. This is a wicked problem. This is not something we're going to be able to literally flip a switch and change. Mm. So um, any, any thoughts or comments on that? I mean, do you know what influence, who influenced, where the fingers were on the scales in the report? Um, I know that there, there was input by um, representatives, government representatives. So the, the thing with the IPCC report is that, yes, it's the research is all reviewed by scientists and then scientists write the text. And um, at the very last minute, like literally like the report um, in May was, was released late because like 24 hours late because there was a lot of haggling about words. Um, and I know that the scientists who wrote it had originally had a phrase in there that said, we must end fossil fuel use as soon as possible. And I know that that was taken out um, based on the, the government representatives um, <clears throat> uh, requests. So, and a lot of these government representatives are folks who used to be in the fossil fuel industry or still are in the fossil fuel industry. Um, yeah. But that's about as much as I know. Yeah. The other thing, you know, Brian, I know you're working on a book on this uh, and, um, you know, what role higher education can play. Um, one thing I don't see discussed very much is a politics for scientists course. Oh, know, that's interesting. Um, you know, because 
it, it's it, scientists. Uh, I, one of my favorite phrases um, uh, from um, Norman, uh, design of everyday things. He says, engineers think everybody thinks rationally, right? And that's the big mistake when they're designing things. Scientists think everybody thinks rationally. And they're like, this is obvious what we need to do. Let's get moving, right? But then they run up against the political winds and the uncertainties, the cracks. I mean, science is uncertain. That's part of the point of it. You know, there's no final answer with science. We're reducing windows of probability is what we're doing. We're not, there's no, everybody thinks science has an answer. We have all these, you know, from the great age of the 1950s, the scientists will come and save us all, you know, and there's still an element of that too. By the way, I, you know, when I talk to people who are somewhat against making major economic sacrifices, uh, one of the common things I hear is, well, we'll just develop technology and it'll, we'll fix it. Well, hold, hold on a second, Tom. Yeah. So you, you asked a great question. And yeah. Dr. Heather Short is making a major play right in that field. <laughs> um, so why, why don't you go ahead, Heather? Politics. Um, yeah, um, that's probably something that most scientists want to stay so far away from because we just like our data and we want to sit in our labs with our data and feel comfortable. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I agree. And I agree with what a lot of people are saying here in the chat as well is that we, this is, you know, science has defined this issue of, of climate and ecological breakdown, but scientists are not the solution to this. They're like technology. There's a wonderful phrase called techno optimism, which, um, which I, I like the phrase, but I don't particularly care for techno optimism <laughs> because it's a false flag. So um, we need people to, to, to challenge this, um, to, to come up with social, um, be better versed in, in sociology and social relations and human relations and politics to, in order to uh, get this sort of movement that we need to see going. Um, but those people also must have a very firm, solid basis in science and understand mm -hmm. how science works. As um, Tom was saying, that it doesn't provide answers, that it doesn't provide truth, that it's a slow accumulation of evidence, um, but that it's really the best that we've our best guess based on some very good, educated guesses from some very smart people. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I would love to see politicians much, much better educated in in science. I. Um, I'm a real uh, advocate for climate literacy, which is not necessarily knowing all about the science, but knowing um, the basics of how we got here, and then also the what what's going to fix it, which is not a technological whiz bang solution. Heck, I'd stand, I'd settle for the scientific method. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the representative we have of quote unquote science in the Senate is Rand Paul. Oh, good no! Oh no! <laughs> He must have gone through a lot of science courses, didn't he? Uh, I mean, you don't care what kind of doctor he is. He's got to have gone through some science courses, right? Maybe. He's not, he's not the worst. And he's not the worst. Um, oh, he's not. But the point is I hold him to a higher standard because he has a medical degree. Yeah. I, which, I in theory, is a science degree at some yeah. level, right? Right. And oh, I, mean, I don't think we teach, uh, I don't think we teach uh, uh, astrological medicine anymore as a concern. <laughs> I'll give give it some time. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, that's no, true. We're heading but the, like <laughs> in the in the seventies and eighties, all of the the hired sort of scientists for the tobacco industry who were saying that smoking doesn't cause cancer were physicists, right? So you you can you can be a scientist, but it's really important to be the scientist right. for the subject, right? Well, but it, I mean, again, the thing is that I see thing I see things coming out of these people's mouths, and I, you know, honestly, there's a part. And I'm, by the way, just as a disclaimer, I am a social scientist. I'm actually a political scientist, so I look at this from the other perspective. Uh, and um, that, but you see things coming out of these mouths that defy critical thinking and la and rational thinking. And I don't know, to be honest, whether that's purely. Uh, hypocritical and politics or whether they're truly ignorant of it. And it's really hard to tell, you know, 
Uh, you don't see them slipping up. I mean, the one thing that makes me think that they're truly ignorant of it is because you don't see them slipping up in the background and going, hey, yeah, these people believe that math thing I pulled on the floor today. You know, um, you don't see that, right? I mean, I've never seen, uh, rarely do you see that. Um, so I'm thinking it's more ignorance than hypocrisy. So it's what a choice, right? <laughs> the best of both worlds. <laughs> Along those lines, in the in the chat, um, we have a, a, a nice comment from uh, Nafisa, who mentions that the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History uh, is opening an exhibition on the environment and climate change called Our Places. And she says, it foregrounds community conversations between scientists, curators, educators, and artists, uh, all leading interdisciplinary education. Uh, so thank you, Nafisa. That's a great thing to learn about. Uh, and I think that's that's one gesture from, you know, in the United States, one of the most powerful uh, uh, cultural institutions. Um, and Nafisa says it's not public yet. So another time the future transform gets a scoop. Um, thank you. Thank you, Nafisa. And here I thought because I couldn't get to it from Texas because we blocked that site. <laughs> uh, well, let's 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 focus a bit a bit more on the um, more on the educational side. We've got a couple of questions that have come in. Heather, Tom, can I keep you up for a couple of minutes? Sure. sure. Um, Naomi Toftness uh, asks a, a really good question. Uh, let me bring, flash this on the screen. She says, what are some things that we can advocate for in our institutions that are heavenly online when all or most of the suggestions for higher ed are focused on physical campuses? So I, well, I would say curriculum. I mean, seriously, that's, I think that's really, our job is to educate people. And so we need to be thinking critically about what we're teaching and how we're teaching it uh and i mean yeah the the physical upgrades of the campuses that's nice and it's definitely something every organization should be thinking about whether they're in higher ed or not but does if all the universities suddenly go green is that really going to make any difference in the grand in the great picture if nobody else does i mean i think the job of the university is to show people hey you know what you know science is a good thing it's actually kind of useful to like not die when you're 35. But it's not you can just, get a lot more accomplished. It's it's not right. just science um, that uh, this was. Uh, oh no! But everything that goes with it, knowledge is a good thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, how do we? That's to me, that's the big barrier is that we have to convince the rest of the world of a problem that they can't see in front of their face. My, you it's real. It's it's it, it's so big, complex, so far away. You yeah. know. Um, it's and and of course uh, uh, any scientist worth his salt is going to go yeah you know what hurricane harvey really sucked and maybe it was made worse by climate change uh but i can't say that that happened because of climate change or that it wouldn't have happened if we didn't have climate change because honestly he can't or she can't because specific events and weather are not something you can predict from climate change you can predict patterns of weather and the fact right. that Harvey popped up out of nothing and surprised us so fast was a direct result of the temperature of the water. But there are other circumstances that could have produced an equally destructive storm. I mean, the Galveston storm in 1900, which was at the beginning of climate change, uh, you know, was a horrible storm. Uh, we didn't see it coming because we didn't have the science to see it coming. It just well, sort look, of went, oh, look, there it is. <laughs> well, look, let me pause you for a second, Tom, because, because this is this is a it sounds like we're wrestling with a, a, a key potential for higher education to do. And Heather, I think, is about to, to pounce all over this. How, how, can, how can we expand our teaching um, of uh, the climate crisis through higher ed? Um, well, I think, first and foremost, that all of the people who work in higher education need to be trained. So the, the, this, this issue is so huge, as, as Tom was saying, is so huge and it's so um, enormous and outside of ourselves and our, the system that we live in is, has got us all like, you know, trained to get up, do our job, go to work, come home, blah, blah, blah. So that we need a new kind of education that, that sort of crosses institutional boundaries and crosses um, sort of hierarchical boundaries within the institution itself. And um, I was teaching in a in a college where my students ended up knowing far more about the climate crisis and what to do about it than all of the other teachers that they went to in their classes after mine and they knew more than all of the administrators so um 
And really what the students need most from us is they need acknowledgement and support. They need to have adults in their lives acknowledge that, yes, this is really bad. Yes, this is really scary. And we're worried too. So that's like the one sort of big key picture that young people aren't getting from grownups. Um, so that sort of starts, it's almost like, I hate to be morbid here, it's almost like a grieving process. Like it starts with knowing, with yeah. understanding, and then it moves into feeling loss. And, and because this is not just a scientific issue, this is absolutely involves human emotions and emotional processing. So um, it's absolutely necessary for students to have educated adults in their lives and, and that means at institutions in order to be able to learn this stuff and then learn how to be um agents of, of change in their own lives in in whatever the future is going to bring so i would advocate for um climate literacy training for all people who work at higher institutions mm -hmm. we should um heather maybe we should do that um okay <laughs> Because this, I mean, Tom. Tom was very kind to mention my upcoming book, uh, which is in the proof process right now. So I'll be talking about it soon. Um, but it's all about higher education and, and the climate crisis. Um, and I, I think this is this is a crying need. Someone's got to provide it. Um, and maybe this is something that we can organize. Um, Great. Also, I'd uh, love to. And, and Rox, Roxanne is right. She says, you know, you got to start early. Uh, we can't wait until college. And I agree. But at the same time, we should be. Um, we teach the teachers, so we should be teaching the teachers how to teach third graders about climate change in those states where it's not illegal yet. Well, well, that's um, yeah, that's 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 all that that's all there. It's got to be a full court press, I think. Um, but right. I'll, I'll, there's a key a key point that came up in the chat. I just want to make sure we got this. Not to be uh, um, uh, pedantic, but uh, uh, Shinli Wong and Shinli, I'm trying. My my Chinese is so bad. I'm I'm really working on it. Um, she said, uh, "Is it so far away?" A short visit to India, Southeast Asia today should be more than enough to convince people that climate change is real. Uh, Lisa Durf adds, it is now. Um, I actually was asked to uh, work with a group of East Asian universities, and they told me not to speak about climate change because it was too far off in the future. Uh, so, you know, there's, uh, there's definitely a divide uh, along these lines. Uh, so, Naomi, uh, that's a great question, and we have a really, really clear answer. Uh, thank you. We have a, another question that comes in from Amanda Burbage, um, and uh, Amanda asks, I'd love to hear how I can become climate literate in, I think that's higher education um, context, and how I can bring climate literacy into my courses. We talk about climate justice, but it feels very far away from my students. Amanda, if just really quickly in the chat, if you could toss in what you teach, uh, that, that would be great. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, I'll put that back up on the stage again because it was a, a it was a very powerful health thing. professions. Amanda oh, teaches you. health professions. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, how do you become education uh, climate literate? <laughs> and then we hear this someone called uh, Heather Short in the chat. I don't know who this is. Says she has an online asynchronous climate literacy course. <laughs> if you if, if that's available, for I people, did. Yeah, I just wrote that in. If, if that's available for people outside of Sterling College students, it is. Uh, yeah, th throw in a link, and, and that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, it just dawned on me. I don't want to be one of those creepy people who's trying to promote themselves, but I like. I'm just saying, I don't get paid anymore for this course. They paid me to make it, and so. But the whole idea was that it's it's a climate literacy course for adults who are not in college. So it's it's continuing. It's not no credit. It's just for um, lifelong learning. Very nice. I will put in. Thank you. Yes. All right. I'll put in the link somewhere. Uh, Shin Lee Wong uh, mentions family in Singapore and the heat. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, I've been there in the summer. It was getting too often and too extreme, uh, getting worse. Um, and thank you, Amanda. Um, I would I would think that in uh, in health classes, um, there's uh, all kinds of angles. When we talk about, for example, changing disease patterns, uh, as well as the direct impact of increasing wet bulb temperatures on the human body. Uh, I mean, offhand, I, I think those would be really, really striking. And we're already seeing the possibility of diseases moving around geographically as biomes begin to change uh, as a result. Mm -hmm. And if he's also... What about... Oh, please, go ahead, Tom. Let's not forget mental health either. I mean, I think that yeah. needs to be a discussion too. I mean, the, 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 the mental health of people who are 
under yeah. stress and strain uh, because of because of climate change uh, uh, effects and things like that. In psychology, there's already a, a series of research efforts trying to name this process. Some have called it uh, climate grief. Some have referred to uh, solastalgia, um, that sense of trying to think about the place where you grew up. I mean, Shelley's point about 10 years in her life, that difference, um, that's that's pretty strong. Um, how you can grapple with that. That's a, that's a great point, Tom. Uh, I just want to add, uh, Nafisa brings in yet another country. Uh, as a Bangladeshi American, she knows climate change feels like a very urgent for family back in the motherland. Yeah, that's absolutely mm -hmm. where the uh, Bangladesh is right on the Indian Ocean. There's, and it's not just right in the Indian Ocean, but it infiltrates quite a bit within the shore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Amanda Burbage adds a little further. I totally agree with the connections, but they are so focused on writing educational objectives, teaching wound care, refining rubrics, etc. It's like the climate crisis is in a box. Mm hmm. Hmm. Um, I I'm wondering whether you have to put that at an at an earlier stage than 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 what Amanda's. I mean, that 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 it needs to be part of a more of a general education requirement, and then it will filter down. But um, yeah, I agree that culture of, and this is a problem in general. I mean, this is a societal problem in that we fight the problem that's right in front of us. The problem that's right in front of us is I can't afford to fill up my gas tank. Right. Uh, or I can't afford the fact that mayonnaise went from three dollars and fifty cents to five dollars a bottle in two weeks in the grocery store. Well, you got to stop using mayonnaise. That's obvious. Anyway. Well, okay, fine. Uh, but you know, it, you know, or or uh, but the, you, you get the point. I mean, these are the things that people are going to be voting on this fall, um, and they're not going to be. If anything, it's going to be an anti-climate change vote. Because I'm stuck with this giant truck that I've, you know, got and uh, that gets eight miles to the gallon and costs me $100 to fill up. And yeah. I'm mad. I am mad because I can't, you know, because I'm because I can't afford to drive this truck. And that's my personal freedom there that you're attacking, trying to take my truck away. Well, that's it. Heather, this this is a question I, I've been I've been thinking about a lot, which is sorry, I, I live in Texas. <laughs> You know, I, I do not have a truck. I will say that I've never had a truck. You heard that you were ventriloquizing, but but uh, but but I wonder. This this is a, a a broader political question. It includes government, but also beyond that, which is, uh, you know, how do we how do we urge people to uh, to take this seriously in a way that doesn't feel like it's uh, abridging their personal liberty? Um, I mean, we're experiencing this with uh, with the vaccines, of course, and public health in general, which is very similar. How, how do we do this, or or should we basically suck it up and say we're in a, it's World War Two, right? We're going to need to organize. Um. Well, I, I'd start by saying that we don't have to convince everybody, but we do need to convince um, a good chunk of the population. So for for folks, and I and I totally understand people who need to and can only think about their day to day lives because they're barely getting by. I totally I totally get that. Um. What we need to explain to people is, well, first we need just general education, like absolute government sponsored, although people are pretty oh. itchy about governments, um, across the board education about what's at stake. So I, I like to sort of tell the story as um, a diagnosis prognosis story where you say, okay, look, everything that we have come to know and live on and depend on and your whole entire way of life is at risk of, it basically is going to go away. <laughs> and it's going to go away um, possibly quite suddenly in a very bad way. So what we can do, and this is serious, this is like getting a cancer diagnosis, right? So oh. we follow that up with prognosis, right? So say, okay, you've got cancer, but if we treat it right now immediately and aggressively and you get lots of support, you will have a livable future. And that's how we have to treat this, the, this crisis and then also all of the other crises that are caused by continuous growth capitalism on a physically finite planet. What, what we have to do is to say, hey, this is going to be hard. This is really going to be terrible. But if we do this and we do it together and we do it in a fair way, then your children will have a livable future. And of course, some people are gonna say, whatever, or you know, your liberal scientist weirdo wants to control everything. But um, 
I think we have to appeal to people's own intelligence and we have to appeal to people's um, sense of responsibility for their kids because um, most people like their kids, most of them, <laughs> right? So, and, and, but that takes trust. And so we need uh, an organization, whether it's the government, whether it's something else that can develop and sustain trust with a large majority of the population. And that's not really easy to do. Um, no, no, but it's, it's crucial, but it's crucial. Uh, so I, yeah. Uh, just, just one thing on well, potential wild card that I've been, um, uh, uh, I've been following for a while as a possibility of a religion of, of some sort uh, that might appear. Uh, so I just threw a, a link to uh, in the chat to a scholarly book on the subject. Uh, Tom just threw in a link to a uh, science fiction take, both of which are very powerful. Um, and that would be hopefully non-governmental. Um, but I, I, this is this is a this is a huge uh, huge effort. I, also in the chat. Uh, uh, Nafisa, I'm oh, sorry, not in the chat. Question: Nafisa put up one that uh, really develops this point a little further. Let's let's share this. Uh, how do we make people care more about the collective good in our curriculum? Interdisciplinary curriculum without cultural critique, a post-colonial approach, and then she likes the World War II analogy. Um, but how, how do you? I'm gonna keep this question up. This is this is as usual for Nafisa. This is a powerful one. I mean, how do you, how do you do that when if you're an undergrad or a grad, you know say and you're you're, you're thinking so taking Professor Haynes in his government class because I got to pass it in order to get my degree or you know I'm taking Dr. Short's environmental studies class because I got to get my nursing degree somehow um, how, how do we make that you know, as as a co collaborative collective good how, is that something we can do in higher Um, I think that <laughs> I think that that would be absolutely awesome to have a, a class that is required for everybody, you know, sort of like a liberal arts curriculum that does exactly that, that that advocates for um, a post-colonial perspective building, at least in in wealthy countries so that we understand a bit how we got to the place we are and we understand what needs to change in order to get us through this. But you're gonna yeah, up, I mean- You're gonna run up against out. ideology there is the problem with that. I mean, there's- That's a, it, but yeah. no, of course, people freak out about that stuff. And yeah, the United States right now is not really the best place to be um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> promoting different sorts of, of ideas. But the thing is, is that if you look at the empirical evidence, if you look at the evidence um, about what is happening um like to all of our nine planetary boundaries yeah. right now on earth really the the only way through this is is to examine how we got here and examine how we're going to ramp everything down we we mm -hmm. cannot continue to grow our economies it's just it just cannot ha cannot happen and it's going to self-destruct anyway so um the more we talk about that, the more that we talk to our peers about that, the more likely that will be acceptable. But we also have to offer a solution, which is taxing the hell out of the rich and using that money to um, create social programs. Well, wow. the way I mean, what I do in, in, in my class, my, I mean, I, the other the other group we really have to talk to is our students. I mean, we they have, they're going to be the ones living this, and um, in in a much more real way than we are. Uh, and one of the things I, I mean, what I do in my class, my class is challenge based. So my students pick a challenge and they run with that challenge for the entire semester, and they talk, and then we spend the semester trying to figure out how to define the challenge, and then also how you know how you would go about navigating some ways of dealing with that challenge through the either the US or the Texas political systems, depending on what the challenge is and so on and so forth. And quite a few students have done some versions of climate change or CO2 mitigation. I mean, I try to get them to be more specific than fix climate change. You, there's no way to do that politically. Um, and one of the things that I think we have to be very mindful of is that they're very powerful systems that we have built over the years, over the last 200 years to defend these industrial uh status quo because they've given us this prosperity i mean we can't you can't ignore the fact that we wouldn't be where we are without oil uh and um 
and that may or may not that, that may be a great thing in one level but at the same time we're going to have to figure out a way to, to 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 deal with that reality so the what i have to do with my students a lot of times is to say okay yeah i mean we want to fix climate change but where do we start you know what can we do and i make them look for very real policies that certain places have put into place and say can you figure out whether or not these things actually work? Do they make a difference? Uh, and um, in terms of CO2 emissions or, or what other, you know, whatever vac uh, variables that they're looking at. Um, I'd like to say that it's 100% successful. I still have, I mean, my course is a required course that everybody has to take. And, and I will be brutally honest about this is that I still have a very large percentage of my students who are just sort of checking boxes and are just saying, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I also like to bear in mind what my grandfather told me when I was first starting out teaching. I was very depressed because I signed all these papers and after a certain point, the students never seemed to get any better at it. And um, he's like, look, you're not going to get any gratitude. You're not going to get any um, uh, you're not going to see an effect of what you're doing. But 10 years from now, some, one of those students, is, those students are going to stop. Some of those students are going to stop and say, you know, I could write this because of what Professor Hames taught me. They'll never hear about that, but I think that's actually very valid when uh, when you're talking about climate change, because these effects uh, we like to think, well, these are things we have to deal with now. And we do. But the, what, what we're going to have to deal with in 10 years is going to be that much more urgent and that much more critical. Uh, and so if they can then go start from at least a period of a, a perspective of, oh, yeah, I did think about this one time in college and we, you know, argued about how it's very hard to define these things and how do we go about solving problems and defining problems. And then at least I have something to work off of as I go around my community trying to make things better or or, or working, you know, work with groups or whatever. That's the best I can hope for. Um, and, and it's one class. Tom, that's a it's 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 interesting nobody has yet in our discussion today drilled down to the point of assessment and uh and that's we're, we might be better off not having done that but, but, uh, <laughs> but, but what you're describing is a kind of long-term educational project where you, know, you want mm -hmm. the students to take a class and and and, and pass or, or pass an exam and get their degree whatever but but that what you're talking about is there should also be a long-term uh impact that we can that we have down the road yeah uh, I wanted to share with you a quote, if I could, from the IPCC report from the uh, uh, the third document. Um, I want to ask everyone what they thought about this, because this is one of the few places where the IPCC actually hailed higher education directly. Um, and this had to do with uh, their focus on resilience, and that is the idea of helping change societies so that societies can better handle the crises that are being thrown at us, from rising sea levels to desertification and so on. And, and here's the quote, climate resilient development is facilitated by international cooperation and by governments at all levels, working with communities, civil society, educational bodies, scientific and other institutions, media, investors, and businesses, unquote. So this, this, they're calling on us in the higher education to participate in climate resilient development and not just for ourselves, obviously, but, but for, you know, the entire society where we are. And I'm, I'm curious, how, how can we do that? Would that be, for example, um, scientists consulting with local cities uh, and counties and states and regions and provinces in order to help um, them be more resilient? Would it involve, uh, say, a climate conservation core that students like the ones you mentioned, Tom, could join? Would it be uh, something larger than that? I'll, I'll just throw this quote in the in a chat so people can see it. But, but please, what, what does everyone everyone think about this? Um, and starting with you two folks that I've pinned to the table. Um, I think a climate conservation core would be would be great. It'd be a really good way to get more people involved. The more young people involved, then the more they talk to their older people in their lives about this. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in the IPCC report itself, um, their goals of, of sustainable development based on the UN sustainable development models uh -huh. are, are really um, 
only take into consideration the climate crisis. So they don't actually look at um, the material throughput that's necessary in order to continuously grow our economy to then develop the rest of the world to lift people out of poverty. So even what the the IPCC report recommends in terms of stable um, sustainable development is is probably pushing the boundaries on other um, planetary limits uh, in order to do that. So, and, and there's still, uh, like I remember I was saying that the report itself is written by scientists, but the, the final wording is, is tweaked by, um, by government representatives and they are very, very, very um, intent on maintaining this idea of unlimited economic growth. And really when you sit down and you look at the numbers, um, it's, it's not possible because if we want to still develop um, economies and um, expand economies indefinitely, um, we will eventually run out of stuff. And that's yeah. like literally where we are right now. We are, we are at that limit. We cannot push the boundaries on ecological destruction anymore. Um, so I think what we have to do is really rethink what we mean by development. How do we hmm. bring, bring up people's quality of life globally? Fairness. This is the whole idea of fairness. And really, um, I think I think the empirical evidence really points to uh, degrowth, to scaling back our economies and sharing the wealth. And and I know that sounds political, and I know that sounds ideological, but it, it is literally the only way that we are going to be able to continue living on this planet. It's a it's a huge huge task. On a, on a, yes. And <clears throat> so, one, if I could if I could just narrow that down because we're we're almost out of time, um, Heather, how does how do we take that message of degrowth to <laughs> colleges and universities where on the one hand, many of them see and their students and the community see their mission as preparing students for careers in a growth economy, but also our finances. I mean, how a university president would tell me, you want me to do more work and at the same time you want to cut my budget. Um, how, how do we, how do we take that message to higher ed? Right. Well, um, that's a tough sell, honestly, because we're all used to this and we've all grown up in this this um, system and this culture and this political culture and we've been rewarded by it, right? Um, and to say that it's not working anymore and to try to convince people it's not working anymore and it's actually going to lead to our overall destruction is really, really hard. So um, I think one of the one of the things that we can go through, and I see somebody mentioned Donut, um, Mm -hmm. economics in the chat we have to instead of thinking <laughs> of um economics and, and continuous growth as as the only way forward we have to instead take a step back and look and think of how can we make an economy a uh, global economy on this planet that actually respects the physical limitations of our planet um and before i started reading about economics i was like wait it doesn't do that um Right. Yeah. So, so fundamentally, I think universities need to think about how can we prepare students to go out into the world in a way that's still going to make sure there's a world to live in. Like, how do we organize our cultures and societies and economies so that we don't end up um, using up everything on the planet? And at, at this point, we're we're at a crisis point. So we really need to, like you were mentioning, Brian. I think sort of take on a um, wartime kind of attitude, although I hate that terminology, and say, oh, yeah, and and just and say, look, okay, emergency time, everybody, we need to just stop business as usual. There you go. We need to stop business as usual for a few years here and get everybody reoriented to thinking very, 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 very differently about um, what they want for their lives and what we expect for their lives. And then we can work on um, regeneration. That makes yeah, you know, I. Go ahead, Brian. No, well, I was just, that makes higher education this kind of an engine of transformation in a very different way than we have been. Um, it's uh, um, in a. I, I hate to go back to the World War II analogy, but just just temporally, uh, it makes me think of the role of higher education in, say, the Soviet Union. I, I don't mean this as a criticism, but just saying that higher education has that explicitly. We will reform and redesign society mission. 
I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Tom. But we're, we're at the end of the hour. We're gonna, we're gonna. Yeah. I, I would just leave you with one quick thought here, and that is that you know this is a paradigm shift in how we think about success, and that's really what Donut Economics talks about. Exactly. Um, unfortunately, our educational systems are based on these same kind of motivators like grades. Sure. Grades are just like money. We've trained all of our students to acquire grades just like we expect them to acquire money as a measure of success after college. I was at a high school graduation last night where my twins graduated. There wasn't a single mention of any sort of limits to growth. It was no. onward and upward. You're ready to succeed and take over the world until the world takes over you. Correct. Well, and this is what an essential part of climate literacy is that is, is we have to redefine what success means for our kids and for us and um, for everybody's life. And there's not even a start to that. That's such an ingrained thing in our systems. And I don't really I know. crack I that think. one. Nut. It doesn't but, mean it's impossible. It doesn't mean it's impossible. And I'm going to keep trying because I'm stubborn. Well, you're stubborn and, and you're, you're, you're a great person in this community, Tom. Thank you. Um, and, and Heather, you're a, uh, in many ways a trailblazer for a lot of us. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll be in touch afterwards uh, by email. Okay. Thank you, Heather. I'll thank be, you. Thank you, everybody, for a great conversation. We ended at a huge moment of higher education as the driver of enormous change. Um, there's a lot going on in this topic. We're going to make this a theme for the future transform. We're going to keep coming back to this. Uh, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, please contact with uh, your requests, your, uh, if there's guests that you think we should haul on stage. And if you want to say more, this forum is for you. Thank you to people who couldn't join us on stage, like, um, uh, oh, gosh, almost all of you. Uh, Lisa Durf, John Hollenbeck, um, Sarah San Gregorio, uh, Vanessa Vale. You've all shared so much. Roxanne, thank you. Thank you all. Um, in the interest of time, let me wrap this up. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this, uh, you'll find that I've been talking about this up a storm on Twitter. So you can tweet at me or use the hashtag FTTE. And I blog about this uh, consistently at BrianAlexander.org. Uh, we're starting to make this into a major topic. And of course, we've been talking about higher education in general for years now. So please take a look at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive for our previous sessions. Uh, we have other topics coming up as well. Uh, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to see more of those. Uh, and if you have been working on the climate crisis or anything else you'd like to share, please just ping me and I'd be delighted to share your own work. Uh, thank you all for this very sobering, very intense, absolutely necessary conversation today. Uh, I'm delighted to be exploring this vital topic with all of you. Thank you so much. In the meantime, Take care, everybody. Be safe, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye.